Welcome to Chapter 12, Choosing Designs for Effect Evaluations. We're getting there. We've only got three more chapters after this. All righty. So in the very beginning of the book, Chapter 1, you learned about the planning and evaluation cycle. We've talked about it over and over. So building on that concept, what we're... Let's just refresh. I think by the time we're done, everybody's going to have this down. But remember, we, um, we have to make a statement of our health problem and assess that health problem. We do that through assessing um, our community with our community health needs assessment. Once that's done, we prioritize various health issues. And then we begin our planning process. The arrows also go this way because as part of the program planning, we also start evaluation planning, meaning we're going to come right here now and we're going to figure out how we're going to design our evaluation because we have choices and the methodology which we're going to use so that eventually we can evaluate the effect of our program. So that's where we are in our planning cycle. All right, so let's talk about some key concepts you read in the book. So the first thing is to always know that rigor is important when you're designing your evaluation process. Whether it's simple or it's complex, you still want to be rigorous because you want to be able to say to your stakeholders, say to um, people in your community, say to people who have participated in your program, we believe these are the effects of the program and this is why. And you want to be able to say it with confidence. Now what's interesting is that most small health programs do not have the resources to do a very complex evaluation. As a matter of fact, you have to put that in as a job description for someone because most of the time when people are hired, they're actually hired to do the intervention. So at the YMCA program, for example, the people that they are hiring are people who are going to run the after-school program. Now, they do have one position that they're calling a grant writing position, and I would imagine that the person who is hired for that position will also be doing some evaluation because that allows him or her to know what future grants to write for. All righty. So, first key concept. Smaller programs often don't have a full-time position, for an evaluator, um, larger programs do, but you can still, if it's a priority, incorporate that in your personnel. All right, some assumptions that you read about that um, occur in the design process of your evaluation. So first of all is regardless of the program or the agency, at least one design exists that is both scientifically valid and realistically feasible for the program. So I think when people are doing program planning, they have to realize that there are some very scientifically valid, simple ways to design an evaluation tool. And there are really complex ones, but you have to decide what is reasonable and feasible for your particular program. How much of your resources do you have to be able to go into it? Do you have an individual who has a background in perhaps statistical analysis that can help you. I know with Barton Fit, we actually um, have a statistician that we pay to help us do some of our analysis. If that hadn't been written into the grant, then we wouldn't be able to work with that person. All right, program personnel will choose the best such option if it is clear and easy to identify. So it's very important that um, the people that are involved in the program understand their choices and then can make the one that best fits for their program. Always remembering that there is a programmatic need to demonstrate the recipients have changed more than might happen simply by chance. So you all have learned this concept in your statistics classes. It's reinforced in these final chapters of the book about chance versus statistical significance. We'll talk about that a little bit more. All right, before we do that, let's talk about a few more assumptions. First, the program is delivered as planned to the attended audience. So when we're designing our evaluation process, we are making the assumption 
that the program as it was proposed was actually delivered that way. So, you know, if with Barton Fit, we said that we were going to have exercise classes three days a week, and then we ended up deciding to have no exercise classes, we would have to justify why we made that decision and um, also be able to say how that would potentially impact perhaps fitness levels that we're going to be measuring as part of our design evaluation. Um, just a little caveat is that um, the fifth assumption is that for some evaluations, what's called a qualitative or mixed method design will yield more accurate or complete information. And what this means is that, um, so if you recall from stats, quantitative data are data that are more numbers oriented. Qualitative is more related to words. So often storytelling, observing, um, focus groups happens with qualitative measures. So sometimes you won't just do quantitative measures like what's somebody's glucose level or their percent body fat, but you actually may decide it's better to have a mix of those. Um, if you recall from the community health needs assessment, they actually had a mixed methods design because what they did was they did three different things. They did the community survey, they did focus groups, and they did the health summit. Well, and the fourth thing, those were the three primary sources. They had a secondary source. They had the um, uh, consulting group that looked at data for the Eastern North Carolina region too. And that's what we mean by a mixed methods design. Okay, so those are some assumptions. Now let's talk about what the chapter calls evaluation design caveats. And really what they're trying to do here is distinguish between using the word design and methods. So when you say the de word design in of an evaluation, it's really that grand scheme that de delineates when and from whom data are collected. So it is kind of the big picture of how you're going to collect your data. And I want to just reinforce, it can be a simple process, but it can also be very complex. I was actually on a meeting um, about the YMCA program, and we were trying to determine this. And for example, we were looking at how to track in students having increased physical activity. And we were talking about everything from a self-report of how many uh, minutes a day you think that you move, um, student perceptions, parent perceptions, to more complex things like wearing pedometers or having Fitbits that they wear. Um, so as you can see, that the design of um, a certain outcome can be simple or complex. So what are methods compared to design? Methods indicate the way in which the data are collected as part of the evaluation, typically consists of strategies like surveys, interviews, observations. I just mentioned it could also be um, something like a pedometer, getting the number of steps that someone has. So design is your big picture methods are the specific ways in which you're going to collect the data. All right, some more design terminology. First, what does it mean when we say pre-testing and post-testing? It's pretty straightforward. Pre means before, post means after. So pre-testing is any testing that's done before receiving the intervention. So it's also termed baseline data, as you can see here in the back. So let's say we have 300 kids starting the YMCA program, we will do some pre-testing, maybe some fitness testing, maybe ask some questionnaires, see where they are at their baseline before they get the intervention of the after-school program. Then we will do post-testing, which is testing after they receive the intervention. Um, they do point out in the uh, chapter that the term test is just a convenient term that refers to measures being used to quantify the effect of a program. All right, so now let's move into how do you choose a particular design when you're doing your research. So I think they make a really good point. The whole aim in choosing your design is to come as close as possible 
to a design that can demonstrate an effect was actually caused by the intervention or the program. We want to know that because the kids did the after school program, that's why they had the change that occurred. And there are some key characteristics to, that allow you to get to this place of cause and effect where you can do that. All right, so they talk about three key design characteristics. <coughs> Excuse me. So the first is, ideally, you want to have a comparison control group that is unexposed, that's similar to the group participating, that you can compare to. So when we do baseline data on 300 students that are going to be part of the program, it would be great to have baseline data on 300 students that aren't part of the program. Whether that happens or not in the Y program, I don't know. Um, but that makes it stronger and more likely for you to be able to say your program made the difference. A second key design characteristic is measurement of outcomes variables should occur before and after the intervention. Sometimes baseline data are not taken, and so um, it's not nearly as strong as if you miss that step. Sometimes baseline data is taken, but post-testing doesn't happen. And then the third key characteristic is you want minimal threats to both internal and external validity. So what again is internal and external validity? So internal validity is the accuracy of what you're uh, testing. So when you say that you're testing self-confidence or perception of um, body image, are you actually, is your measure actually testing that particular psychological construct? External validity is your ability to generalize your findings to different populations. So if we find out that we see our after school program makes these significant changes, can that be generalized to an after school program in Greenville, North Carolina, in Wilson, North Carolina, in Africa? Okay, so we want as much internal validity as well as external validity as possible. So now let's talk about the concept of causality. So make sure that you understand this. And I have talked about this to you all before, but I'll reinforce it on this video. Okay, so the first decision in choosing a design is how important is it for you as a program to determine causality or cause and effect? To be able to say, because A happened, then we got B effects because of A. Because of the YMCA program, students had higher grades in school. Students moved more. Students made better choices in, with their diet and ate more vegetables, okay? So what's really important, and this is emphasized on page 290 in figure 12.1, so if you go ahead and turn to that, um, what's super important is there is a direct relationship between causality and the cost and complexity of the design, meaning, as figure 12.1 shows, is the ability to show causality. The higher the ability to show causality, the higher the design cost and complexity. So if you look in the green square and it says outcome documentation, so you have... Um, where you do one group and you only do pre-testing. You can't really say cause and effect if you do that, but it's also very inexpensive and very simple to do that. And that may be the only feasibility and resources you have. As you go up and you do observational designs where you have two groups, but you don't randomly assign, get more information more expensive. And then notice as you go up higher and higher, especially when you get to what's called random assignment, you have a comparison group, you do pre-post testing, get the most information, but it costs the most, and it's the most complex design. 